Well, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 11th of December, 2013, and we have a juxtaposition tonight. And so far, the responses to that juxtaposition have been rich, and it should be really interesting, I think. Um, so we do have a few people on to talk about Hour of Code, and we're also... Um, wanting to talk about a series that's running in the New York Times this um, this week, and it's actually been published already online. Um, I've only read the first one, so. <laughs> so um, well, that makes about, me feel better. I've like, I was like trying to race through to finish I know, before I know. this call started. It's OK. The, the, we, can, we, can, we can talk about the issues, I'm sure. So um, anyway, yep. And, um, which is about a young woman who lives in a shelter in New York City. Um, and um, so we're going to bring those two together somehow. And I, the people on this call have encouraged me to think that it's quite possible. Um, let's see. Catherine Shorten's not here, but others are. Let's, uh, so let's jump in. Uh, Moria, you are the person I know least here. <laughs> so let's start with you, if you don't mind. Sure, Introduce yeah. yourself, if you don't mind, and um, and we'll get started from there. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get everybody um, introduced. Yep, go ahead. My name is Moria Kavaris. I am the co-founder and executive director of a, an organization called ScriptEd, which um, teaches computer programming to students in low-income communities. Um, we're in five high schools in New York City right now, working with about 75 students. Um, we teach our students the fundamentals of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In the summer, we place those students in internships with tech firms and their paid internships. Um, our organization is nearly 100% volunteer run. I just went on full time in September, but ran the organization in addition to my full time job for a year before that. Um, and our volunteers teach the courses to our students. Um, so that's that's script dead in a nutshell, and that's that's what I do all the all day every day. We just did our hour of code um, today, so uh, with Harlem Village Academy's high school um, with their middle school students. So I just came back from that. I'm still wearing my script dead T-shirt. You probably can't see it, but it's, it's on. <laughs> Okay. Sure. It looks like somebody's asking for a link, so I'm just going to post a link uh, in the chat to ScriptEd's website. It is scripted.org? Uh, yep, scripted.org. Okay. Right. So just keep in mind, um, although uh, eventually this will become a podcast, we hope, so sometimes we need to uh, identify them that verbally as well. The... Um, it, and I noticed on your website that uh, New York NYC is mentioned. Are there script eds elsewhere as well or not? There are not. We're hoping oh, okay. to possibly expand next school year. Um, you know, if, as a nonprofit, we're, we don't, uh, we're relying completely on donations right now. So um, to expand, we're just going to have to raise more money or figure out a better way to, uh, to, to, to get money <laughs> another way. I don't know. So, um, yeah, we're just in New York for now. So I'm Paul Allison, and I'm a teacher at a uh, small school, brand new small, small school in the Bronx called uh, New Directions Secondary School, and I work with the New York City Writing Project as well. Um, and I would love to do more scripting and do work with uh, students very similar to, um, how do you say your name? Da Moria? Oh, no, no, your name. <laughs> No, the, the girl in the, in the article is... Um, Dasani? Dasani, yeah. I don't know why that sticks for me. And so, um, it'll be, uh, I was talking with a colleague at my school today about um, Dasani and um, saying that she could be one of our students, and she missed that I said could be and, said, and figured that she probably was. She's so familiar to us, so... Um, yeah. The, and her family. But, um, so... That's uh, some introduction. Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Keep going here. I'm Stephanie West Puckett, and I teach writing at East Carolina University. I'm also associate director of the Tar River Writing Project, and I've been doing a lot of work um, with teachers and with students um, around Teach the Web, Mozilla's tools. Um, today, in fact, we were, um, during our final exam, which was a hack jam, uh, we were doing... Um, 
six word memoirs and x-ray goggles and um, you know trying to get our uh, hour of coding in today um, so, yeah cool Monica welcome and Ma you can unmute you know what's wrong <laughs> you made a face God. I was just texting again to get yeah. Nikhil in here I think he thought it was later um I am in Loveland, Colorado, and um, we've been kind of experimenting with um, what if this whole city was the school, um, which then takes juxtaposition as like second nature, right? <laughs> so. Cool. So, yeah, and and it was actually, uh, I mean, I was reading the article, but it was your tweet that said, you know, this is a must read. That, I said, oh, okay, let's go there. So thank you for joining us full force here tonight, Monica, and help us make this conversation happen um, as we go. Um, and is it my, Mia? Yes. Mia, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Mia Zamora, and I'm a director at Kane University Writing Project, which is in Union, New Jersey. Um, I'm an associate professor of English there as well. Um, one of the things that I've been doing as of late is um, I'm teaching electronic literature, which has been a really nice sort of open gateway to issues around coding and the question of digital literacy in the most explicit sense, thinking about both reading and writing um, in a digital context and making in a digital context. Um, tomorrow we're celebrating the Hour of Code at Kane University. Um, we're having a um, code-in, like a campus code-in, which is actually, the emphasis there is on the intergenerational aspect. So we're going to have children and university students and professors, you know, all the different um, constituencies that are involved with the university or connected to the university coming together to play and make together for a couple of hours. So it should be interesting. Cool. Welcome. Um, Kim, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. You'll need to unmute, Kim. <laughs> You're muted still? And you can leave it unmuted, too. Uh, as she's working on that. Chris, do you want to join us? Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, my students uh, have been, I guess as far as tonight's show, um, kind of doing the Mozilla Hacking the Web 2, um, like uh, Steph's students, um, in particular Popcorn. And then I have a girl who is organizing kind of a thimble uh, workshop tomorrow all on her own. She's just using my room, so um, see how that goes. Cool. And Nikel, do you want to introduce yourself? Please. Welcome back Hello. to Teachers Eating Teachers. Um, my name is Nikhil Goyle. Uh, I'm 18 years old. I'm the author of two books. One of them is forthcoming on reclaiming the freedom to learn. Uh, I'm an activist. I'm currently working on a few different projects. One of them is the city's the school experiment, as well as a student bill of rights. Uh, and I'm based in New York. Cool. Welcome. So, Monica, can I throw it to you, and then we'll get back to the coding um, and say why? I, I mean, the phrase that, that, that um, I've been using is, uh, in, in all the emails to, to you all um, was that the, the the article caught you know grabbed my throat, and that in other words, like um, I just want to kind of learn more through this and try to understand our different situations. Um, can you kind of describe the article as you've seen it and get us started that way? And then we'll get to the coding stuff, I think, as well. Is that a fair? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Well, just a, a tiny bit of background. Um, yeah. The experimenting we've been doing, um, one of the first things many of the kids were interested in when they found out they could really and truly study whatever they wanted or research whatever they wanted or do whatever they wanted a lot of them were interested in homelessness and human trafficking, and specifically in um, youth homelessness. So we got connected early on um, with Mark Harvoff, who um, started Invisible People. And um, he just weekly has connections. Um, 
he's interviewing um, homeless people. He's been homeless. But anyway, that, that's where, where all of our resources, not non-local, have come from. And um, Tell so me more about him. I'm, I don't know that much. His so. last name is spelled H-A-R-V-O-T-H, -H, mm -hmm. Mark Harvoth. Um, if you, I, I can throw Where's out a... Where's he located? Um, um, I'm not even sure. He's <laughs> all over the place with his videos. It's Invisible People, um, mm -hmm. but he, he does an interview of, like, real raw interviews um, with homeless people um, because he has that rapport with them. Like today, one was um, a girl named um, Jonah Lisa, and um, she's in New York, homeless in New York, um, now involved with Covenant Heights, or Covenant... Covenant um, House? What the last name is. Um, it's, there's a Covenant House in New York. Yeah. Maybe Covenant House, right. That's what it is. Um, but, so anyway, the whole idea now back locally... Um, and globally as well, is that we've got, you know, we take all these surveys, um, we feel like we have a good feel for how many are homeless, and we're finding out from homeless adults, and I'm speaking out of ignorance here, so just go with me. I mean, I could be completely off, but this is my take on it. We've got all these homeless adults that um, we think we have a fairly good number on, um, and they're telling us, that there's even more youth that we don't even know about because um, once they're in the system, there's just so much, you know, of privacy and um, abuse that they may or may not have had um, that keeps them quiet. Um, there's, I just finished reading Paulo Freire, thanks to Nikhil, and the, the whole idea of oppression and, and keeping us silent, you know. So when I saw the Dasani, um, story, um, it just really unfolds a lot of that, um, of how we get in a situation and we, we, like her talking about, you know, being around different sorts of people and she knows how she's supposed to be in order to not get in a fight, you know, um, and, and how much do we have to make sure that we are not ourselves in order to keep something, you know, peaceful. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to stop with that and I'm going to hand it off to Nikhil, um, because I feel like, I feel like he might have even more of a, a, an in-depth insight into this, um, this, the whole ramification because of his book, his first book, One Size Does Not Fit All. I mean, I, I see all the juxtaposition of it, um, because, okay, so the first week of school that we were freed up from not just writing our own curriculum, we could learn whatever we wanted, they were Skyping with James Bach and asking him, how can we cure homelessness? And he was saying that you, you can't, that you know, providing resources is a better way. But that got us to thinking about, you know, there's some kids in a classroom, I mean, homeless doesn't just mean without a house. So now you can think it's anybody that doesn't feel that belongingness, you know, are, are they, do they feel like they're known by someone, um, that might be even more relevant. So then when I, when we read Nikhil's book, um, to me it's like, if there's something that really matters, the multi-levels or the multi-places that you can see it pl being played out, the more you really get it. And so that's why I feel like Nikhil's book and the homeless situation, you know, if you, if you Try to figure out what matters to each of those. Um, so, passing it off to Nikhil, if you want to take it at this point. You're muted. Uh, you um, yeah. Is there anything you want to want me to specifically touch upon, or just how how you res well you responded to the Dasani story? Um, you yeah, live in New York. Um, we've talked a lot about where you live and and how affluent it is and I guess I guess the point that I really like is we feel like we, we need to fix things when actually the people a lot of times the people that feel like they need to fix things are the ones that need the help the most you know and a lot of times places that we need to fix have the most community sense 
Um, and that's what a lot of us are lacking more of. And Nikhil, right. we've had a conversation about that. So I don't know if you want to go there or just... And yeah. it's just a response from the Dasani story would be right. Kind of and then let, let's open that up to everyone after you do. Uh, let, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so story. I would, yeah. I would. So um, I read the first part of the story. I didn't get to finish the other few parts. That's about where we all are. That's cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but um, what what I what I got from that story right. were a few different things. Um, the first one, um, in particular, to education was that this um, this child was going to a school. That I, in my opinion, seems very oppressive. Um, she has to go through a metal detector to to get to school, uh, to get into the building. She, um, uh, she has teachers who are um, who seems to seem to just tell her what to do. She got yelled at one time because she wasn't paying attention. Um, it seems like an environment that is um, lacking in a lot of the things we want to see in school environments. Um, really? So I, got, I, I, I got a, Yeah, I whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No I act <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, speak up. Yeah, I thought that her school environment was her refuge. At yes. least that's what it seemed like to me, and it seemed like that one teacher she had was so supportive of her, and her principal gave her so many chances, and mm -hmm. it seemed like the school environment was kind of like her haven. To me, right. anyway, and I, I mean, I've worked in schools for a long time, and it seemed like a pretty supportive environment to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think I'm sure it was. It's certainly a haven. It was much better than our current situation, but it seemed like it could be. It, it could be so much better. Um, I mean, sure, but that one teacher she had seemed like a, her role model, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, they, they make the point, you know, one in one of the later sections. I actually stayed up till about 3 a.m. so I could finish it. I had intended to, to just skim it, and I couldn't, like Paul said, you know, just grabs you. Um, and to me, I mean, thinking about the, you know, they mentioned the, the threat of, um, I think they call it an apartheid charter school um, that's trying to encroach on the space and the sort of laughable budgets um, that the school's operating under, but despite all that, I mean, to me, I got a real sense of of, of love and compassion, mentoring, um, you know, um, inspiration that Dasani was getting from school as that place of refuge. And I guess what was powerful for me in that is that it started um, making me rethink what it means to be accountable, right? So school accountability and to whom are we accountable and, you know, why are we accountable to the governor's organizations or um, associations to educators or, um, you know, and, and is, is a common curriculum, um, I mean, it, what we see is such a stratified experience for kids in America and how is a common curriculum in any way, you know, relevant to kids who have such differing experiences. Um, so, it, you know, it just it raised so many questions for me and really made me wonder about our discourses in education and accountability um, and thinking about who are we as teachers really accountable to. And to me, it's the it's kids like Dasani. Yeah, absolutely. Any other quick reactions to the story? Let me... And, and, and I, I would certainly be on, I mean, my response was also that the school seemed to be the place, whatever, you know, you know, metal detectors, that was in the building, not necessarily the school. That's one thing worth understanding. Um, but the, um, it was a place where she could be more who she was, right? Um, whereas... She could not even pretend to be a, a little girl, even in her own family. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so it was a it was a place of refuge in that way. And and what ends up being really interesting, and we what we're struggling with in a brand new school is young people like that who come to school, and it's a place where there is some peace and some protection and some yeah. love. Um, then have a space to act out and be themselves, right? Um, and then that becomes, then you see that with Dasani too, right? So Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, that students like Dasani crave that structure of school and that, like, kind of that formal 
environment. I mean, I know with Script Ed, we, we're an after-school program, and we have kids staying and our volunteers staying till pretty late, and I think a lot of times it's because our kids don't want to go home. And I think a lot of schools in New York City function that way for a lot of students who find school to be their refuge. I'm going to ask a question right now, which is Ooh, it's a simple one, which is, Paul, what did this you have in mind? Yes, yeah. um, sorry. Um, what did you have in mind, Paul, when you were marrying these two topics together? The story of Dasani and the issues of education and the issue of um, new digital literacies and bringing that into American ch uh, school children's lives. You know, this, I thought that it seemed a, a rather rich nexus or marriage to make, but I'm wondering how we can get started with a conversation around those two things at once and what are the Thank issues you. at stake. Keep going. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll jump. I guess I'll just dive mm. right in. <laughs> Although I'm not sure I'll, um, you know, address the the really egregious and serious issues that the portrait of Dasani, um, you know, makes us grapple with. But that said, in an effort to sort of marry these two topics together a bit, I'm just wondering a bit about the issue of. Um, you know what it means to learn to code and I think a lot of times people are thinking of these things in more technical or professional terms like this is a skill and it's going to get me um, some kind of professionalization that's going to pull me up or get me employable in a specific way and I think that well, that's and the, the hour mm -hmm. of code promotes itself that way too doesn't precisely it? I mean, like yeah you're gonna, you're gonna there are going to be all these jobs for you when you right. learn to code and, and <laughs> exactly, and it's and also it's, yeah, Pat Delaney help, helps us question that in a recent blog post. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's a um, a misguided um, perception. Perhaps it's like the result of the meme overall, like um, this kind of promotional quality to the the movement itself. But, but what's it mean for you and your students? For yeah. me, it means you know I I recently had a conversation um, with a group uh, with a, a bunch of colleagues and. One of them was Mitch Resnick, who's the um, one of the designers of Scratch out of MIT Media Lab, and I really like the tagline of that whole program because basically um, it's learn to code, code to learn, and it's really emphasizing um, that computational thinking is a whole new way of thinking that is a very important 21st century learning skill and that it can apply to a variety of different environments and ways and of doing things and making things in the world and that is the gift we want to give our children in a way is that ability to not to, to gain a certain digital confidence and be able to read the front end and back end of something to play and remix but we still have to do what we're all here in this panel committed to and always have been, which is, um, you know, give students a foundation so they can find themselves and find themselves in the world. But this digital literacy is sort of like a, um, a kind of, this new kind of digital literacy is a, a kind of complement that's necessary going forward in addition to the foundations that we all are committed to build, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, Mario, do you want to... Yeah, I, I can jump yeah. in here. I okay. mean, this is where I see it being more than just an economic thing and a, mm -hmm. a pathway out of poverty, which for a lot of students it frankly could be. But I think a broader issue we also need to think about is if you think about who is creating technology for us right now, we, we think of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, mm -hmm. the folks who founded Twitter, they're all white men. They're all solving, like if you, the one of the biggest apps that's out right now is Uber or one of these car, find, you know, services that will help people find cabs faster. And that's solving a problem for a very, very, very specific set of people. Um, if we really want to start solving problems of poverty, we need to enable people that actually face those problems with a, a method of solving them. and enabling our students or giving our students the tools to create technology will help them solve problems in their own lives um, because they'll come at those problems from a certain perspective that I don't have that many of the people that know how to code don't have so it, I think it's 
it's a, a it, we need to teach kids how to code, especially kids from low-income communities, because they need to start solving the problems in their communities, and who better to solve it than the people that face them every day. So, um, why did um, what's Script Ed's vision in terms of um, why have you decided to work with the schools you've decided to work with? Um, I mean, frankly, it's I've always worked with students in low-income schools for my entire career, and um, when Script Ed first launched, I I mean, I had worked with kids for six years, uh, probably about a thousand kids, and they told me they wanted to grow up to be doctors, lawyers, you know, athletes you name it, but they never said they wanted to be programmers um, or software developers. Um, and this was really interesting because there's so many kids that are obsessed with technology and love being on Facebook, love getting out there on Twitter, but don't ever think of themselves as people who can actually create the technology mm -hmm. they're using. Um, and I just, you know, my co-founder and I both believed that, you know, we needed to give our students the ability to do this and show them that this is a career path and show them that, hey, you, know, you too can actually do this. This is something that's available to you because most students don't even think of it as a possibility, uh, especially from the students that we typically work with. I, you almost asked it, but so let me just put a point on it, that it would be a great question to ask what kind of technology does Dazani's family need, right? Um, and I guess helping, having families like that develop it would be interesting. Monica, do you want to tell quickly the story of Leo? Um, does that make sense at this sure. juncture? Yeah. Um, I'll throw in here. If you guys have heard about Leo and Patrick, um, I thought it was pretty interesting. Again, I'll go back to Paulo. <laughs> and one of the things in his book was um, it's almost like if, if you're not going to have trust, liberation is not going to happen. <laughs> Leo Grand is a homeless guy. He'd been homeless for two years. Patrick and. In, about in your community, is that right? Or no, it, I'm pretty sure they're in New York. Okay, if you I didn't, click on I that didn't. link. Someone okay. can reference it. But I didn't get to do it yet. Go ahead. Yeah, no, so. he's either on the East Coast or the West Coast. Okay. Um, Patrick's young guy, um, tech white guy, um, Leo's black um, homeless guy. Um, Patrick had been seeing Leo um, when he walked to work every day and started thinking and decided he, he was going to offer him $100 on the spot or to teach him to code, for give him a, a laptop and teach him to code every day for an hour. Um, and surprisingly, he took the, I want to learn to code, um, surprisingly to Patrick. Um, also, when Patrick shared this information, he got a lot of backlash. I mean, um, he wondered himself, in the interviews I've gotten this, and I could be all wrong again, but this is my perception of what I've read. Um, in the interview, um, Patrick was doubtful that, that Leo would even maybe go through with this. You know, he just didn't know if he could learn to code. Um, on the other side, a whole bunch of people were thinking Patrick thought he was this guy who was going to go save people, you know, just another, you know. Um, so, so from both ends, there was non-trust. Um, but when you delve in and trust, we'll listen to more of the story. Now, um, just yesterday or today, Leo's coming out with his app, and as you were saying, um, Maria, is that how you say your name? Is that right? Maria, yeah. Yep. Um, it, he developed an app that is about carpooling, um, but his passion is that um, we would live in a better world, and so his app helps to create um, trees or uh, it's something with, uh, with environmental I think issues. I actually saw yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess I guess the what I thought was really cool is nothing's going to happen unless we trust. We, and we can't wait to see so that we trust. We just have to trust. And um, Chimmy Amanda's TED Talk is just forever ingrained in my heart, um, the, the danger of just one story. We just assume things, you know, and, and the labels have helped us to assume even more, you know. So I, I just th think Leo and Patrick is a great story of it's, it's got coding involved. And to me, um, coding um, is kind of the coming together of 
reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know, um, it's it is a new form of literacy. I don't think it's the end all because I think we're just always morphing. But right now, it is it's a really good literacy to know. Um, I also don't think we can say you should come here and learn this because you're going to need it later. I spent 20 years teaching math that way. And it's not really helpful. Leo got to say, I need to learn to code. So they would meet for an hour before Patrick went to work. And then Leo would spend six hours that day um, teaching himself, you know, finding stuff online from what his mentor told him that hour each day. Um, so I just think there's a lot of really cool ideas from that story. Thanks. Was somebody going to jump in there? Well, I had a question. Um, and it's probably for Moria and um, Mia and, well, everybody, I guess, because it's like, okay, so I have this girl who uh, comes in early and stays after school um, because she doesn't have Internet, you know, connection at home. And uh, But, you know, like, I'm not like that guy Patrick um, who, who has a sense of, of coding. You know, I mean, I kind of know a little bit. But you know how how does that work for people? Like, how do you get those kids engaged in in even thinking that they can solve their problems with technology? You, for someone like me, like Maria, I'm wondering how you do it in your situation. Like, how do you introduce kids, and and how do they have that success? And then for me, who doesn't really think a lot about that, how do you even how do I even begin? to open that window for somebody. Yeah, I mean, to be very frank, I don't think that any of our students have developed apps that are going to save the world quite yet. We're still quite young as an organization. What we have seen um, is that the coding process, well, first of all, the engagement piece, I think that having a mentor or a guide just kind of like in the story you were speaking about um, just a minute ago is incredibly important. I think a lot of our students aren't um, encouraged to do it by a lot of people, so having the mentorship is an important part of it. But the actual learning to code process for a lot of the students, it forces them to um, start looking at problems differently than they normally do. We, uh, we've got a lot of students saying that after a year with us, they, they look at problems differently. They learn how to be persistent a lot more. Um, and even though that's, they're not necessarily building the app to save the world yet, like the, the fact that they're telling us that they now look at problems differently is um, you know, pretty powerful in itself, that they, they think that they can be problem solvers now. Um, I don't know what to say beyond providing mentorship and resources um, to students, but I would encourage your student to keep working at it. There's so many resources online. If she can find some a mentor that knows how to code, that's probably, you know, a very good starting point for her. It seems to me also that if you couch the whole endeavor in the issue of play then it, it sort of opens doors and excites the imagination. So creating something, um, playing, making things, um, that, that's, there's a sort of wow factor in, in being able to create something on the screen and you're the one who designed it. So if you can sort of harness that in some, in some way, even for a short period of time, it's sort of open, it's a gateway to understand. And I think you're right um, in talking about the, the, the problem solving skills and the, the way in which it opens up a whole um, new way of thinking of things. Um, so, but I think the approach in regards to framing it within a play and making and creating is crucial to making it something appealing. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if we're um, grooming um, students to make complex, scalable systems or even become great programmers as much as we are trying to provide a new literacy that will have a role in no matter what it is they want to do with their lives. I, I agree with you. Um, I Kim, go ahead, go ahead. Introduce think, yourself a little again. Oh, I'm, I'm Kim Dullard, um, director of the San Diego Area Writing Project, and I also great. teach 
a multi-age class of first, second, and third graders. And this, um, this idea of play, I think, is critically important. And for me, the my, my students have been using hopscotch to learn to code. And um, I don't know how good they are at it. Some of them are better than I am. Um, but what I'm finding is I'm agreeing with what was just being said is that it's really about problem solving. And I really feel like there's a lot of developing of stamina that happens when students are engaged with this whole idea of figuring out how to make something work. And they're not doing it in isolation. So the idea of mentorship doesn't actually have to be an adult helping a child. I'm actually finding that my students are helping each other and that they're figuring something out and then sometimes even remixing something that another student had done in order to um, take, it, take it to a next step. And that sense of um, learning from each other and learning in community and um, the idea that when it doesn't work, it doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means you haven't figured it out yet. Um, I think is a really important message to get across, not only for children, but for people. And so the problem solving piece of it, I think, becomes so translatable to other areas. And that's what I feel like I'm starting to really see in my classroom is that this idea of iteration and learning from your mistake and studying what did what did you do last time, what worked, what didn't work, and then trying a next step is transferring across um, other content areas, other other aspects of, of students' lives, which mm -hmm. seems important to me, whether they become computer programmers or you know any other profession in their lives. Yeah. And I, I actually think, just to tag along with that, I think that's also part of the reason that mentorship is so important because a lot of students, if they try coding by themselves for the first time and don't realize, like, oh, I forgot a semicolon and, and oh, I just must be terrible at programming. It's like, well, no, this, you're not terrible at programming. You just forgot a semicolon. And having that person there to be like, this is okay that you're not getting it right away. This happens to everyone is really important. Um, so I think, you know having someone there to tell kids, it's okay if you're failing and failing and failing. This is very normal. Um, you have to keep trying. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and as a teacher who was new to this coding business this summer, you know, I sat down because I saw the um, uh, beautiful six-word memoirs that were starting to circulate this summer through National Writing Project that were coded with Mozilla Thimble, and I thought, I want to do one of those, but I know nothing about code. Um, and I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anyone I could really talk to locally. Um, but in using the thimble templates, you know, they're, they're designer notes. There's just just try this. Just change this and see what happens. And that it's that sort of immediate, um, uh, really tangible impact that you can see that a character or a symbol has on your composition. Um, because when you're working in thimble, the code is on um, one side of the panel and then what you're remixing, um, that template is on the other side, and so you're seeing the changes that you make. Um, and I could go, oh wow, that worked, you know, or it didn't work, and it was so, it was so immediate and really sort of gratifying, but terribly hard. I mean, I remember I spent that sort of first day kind of by myself for four or five hours just trying to figure this stuff out and thinking, I'll never figure this out. Um, but I did, I finally changed my six words. Um, and I was sort of proud of just changing the words and not even getting into the CSS and, and you know, but then I just wanted to play with it more. And I've seen the same thing happen in my classroom um, is that my students are really looking closely at, um, you know, not even, we talk about a lot in writing classroom sentence level concerns, right? I mean, they're looking at, um, you know, closer than that now, you know, they're looking at, at symbol concerns um, to really pay attention to, to what's happening and sort of, again, that sense of play, that sense of tinkering, and they've really been attracted to the transgressive nature of hacking, um, using the x-ray goggles from Mozilla um, to take existing websites and, uh, you know, change them, hack them. Of course, they're creating new URLs and not technically hacking the site. Um, but it's, it's about seeing the power, seeing words, symbols, writing as having the power to change 
to change text, to change the world, to come to voice. Um, and I even have, you know, one student who was reflecting on that, you know, from her experiences in, in coding this semester. And again, we are not coding new apps. We're not changing the world, right? We are really just playing with, with these literacies. Um, but she writes that she has a brand new appreciation and, and awe for language in general and the ability of language to make things and to make an identity for her as a writer and potentially um, a, a developer or coder one day. Um, so those things have been really um, powerful for me to see happening in, a, in the classroom where no one is an expert in coding. Um, we don't really have many mentors. We do a lot of just Google searching, looking up CSS stuff, and it's truly leveled the playing field in my classroom because the students catch on more quickly than I do. Um, in a lot of cases, and so we're all you know, really just trying to figure this out together, and it's been a place where we can come to writing without anyone having too much expertise, which I think sometimes can be problematic in the classroom. So, Ste Stephanie, this is a, 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 comp a freshman composition class, yes? It is. Um, mm -hmm. At East Carolina University, when we have um, our student population, a lot of first-generation college students, these particular classes have a lot of uh, rural students from eastern North Carolina enrolled in them. Um, and so, you know, they're, as they're reflecting today, I forget how scared they are. Um, so I'm reading their end-of-semester portfolio reflections, and they're just talking about how they've been scared to death to come to college and all these expectations that, uh, you know, particularly a writing teacher would have in college, you know, 10 points off for every misplaced comma, and they're like, but then we just started playing with symbols and playing with language and making meaning together, and, uh, you know, it, it's not what I expected was kind of the <laughs> what they're reflecting on. Um, and, you know, to me, that it's about sort of transgressing boundaries of, of who has authority and, and agency and, and how do we um, sort of work together to build that, um, everybody bringing sort of unique perspectives and, um, you know, skills into the classroom. Back, back to Chris's question, um, which we've been on, but I'm just, um, I think the main thing, if we really want to empower kids and we really want them to feel like we're there to to help them with what they need to change the world or to just be themselves the best they can be is we need to give them space and permission because I even though we, we say it over and over and we feel like it in this space they're still thinking there's the right answer that they're supposed to come up with you know like so we say you know let's learn to code well um, like Leo and Patrick again, there's got to be a desire or passion first because then you can get grit is a is a, a buzzword now, but the way that we've used grit, to me true grit just comes from you finding the thing you can't not do and then the resilience comes from I can't not do this because it it's it's how I'm getting to this bigger thing and until we get to that place with our kids um, they're going to always wonder, you know, why couldn't I make it go that way? Why couldn't I make my program go that way? Why can't I read like this other person? Um, and so, again, I, I think that one of the big key things, Chris, is spaces of permission where you have nothing to prove. Um, until we get to that place and until kids truly believe they're in a space of permission where they have nothing to prove, and teachers feel like they're in a space of permission where they have nothing to prove, um, we're always going to be looking for the right answer, you know, for the, the end of the day. So, and, and as I was listening, I was hearing one of the things that um, I think we can learn from seeing Dazani's story and um, thinking about our students who are like her is that they, they have grit and persistence and resilience given their life experiences, right? Many of them. That's one of the strengths that they have. Yep. Um, but to me, that's a different yeah. grit, and that's where, like, KIPP schools and different places come in because we think you have to go through something bad in order to have this grit. But I've, I've seen, and a lot, a lot of us have, a different grit that comes from you find the thing you can't not do and you can't not do it. You can be just as strong and it and that to me that's where the sustainability comes in. Because if you've got the other kind of grit, as soon as 
those barriers are gone. They're not sustainable with that grit. But if it's something that, that you've owned and you, you can't not do it, it doesn't matter what's around you. You've got that grit. So to me, those are different grits, Paul. But can't we build on it? Can't we say that's a strength that, that these young people have? Well, sure, you can build on it. But it'd be better mm -hmm. that they didn't have to didn't have to deal with that in the first place. Yeah, but Monica, they do. <laughs> I mean, this this is the reality of who, who we're working with. You know, these are these are the young people who who are in our schools. So what do we do with that? If you're asking me, I'd say we, we give them spaces of permission where they have nothing to prove. Right. But so so again, if you read, I, I, and I think it's worth coming back to, Nikel, um, I, I'd love for, I want you to get back in here. But, but I was also hearing people say that you need hours. Once you have a coding project you want to do, let's just say it that way, um, you need hours to be able to work on it. It's like... Um, and our, so what so it made me wonder what kinds of schools do we need for you know for that to happen or can it only happen in after school programs and out of school programs I will say in um, our local district, one of the uh, partner schools, high schools that we've been working with through one of the seed grants, um, has instituted what they call Smart Walk, and it's 80 minutes of free time in the middle of the school day. Um, so students, this is 9 through 12, um, they have to eat lunch somewhere in that time. But then they're given an opportunity to work with teachers, to um, hang out in the library, to hang out in the computer labs. And by the way, the computer labs are always full. Um, you can just really see how much the kids um, are gravitating to those spaces. Um, but, you know, it's a time for them to sort of manage their, their own um, learning, you know, manage, manage their day. And it gives kids a space to do this kind of work. Um, so we've been working a lot around connected learning um, and having students uh, design connected learning projects. And it's, it's been a, um, a, a space to find mentors in the school and even mentors coming in from outside of the school. Um, and to, to have that time and opportunity to play, you know, to, to figure things out. Um, and and with the school saying yes, it's okay. You might be idle on Monday. Yeah, you might kind of just sit around Monday and Tuesday. You might make something amazing, and that's okay. That's cool. I mean, I think that there are there are very few schools that actually grant children the full freedom to learn at their at their disposal. I think there are very very few. There are some schools called democratic and free schools, and what their whole premise is that children are natural learners. And you should not interfere with their learning. You should not try to show them how to learn. They are natural learners at birth. And if you give them freedom and space and the resources, they will all rise up to the occasion. Um, the amazing thing about these schools is that th these kids, they teach themselves how to read, teach themselves how to write, um, do basic arithmetic, and all types of subjects. Um, and they end up really successful and happy and fulfilled adults later on in life. Um, without being forced to do any of the menial, monotonous things that most kids have to go through in traditional schooling, where you have to take tests, you have to take certain classes. Um, I mean, Google talks about how they have this 20% rule, um, and yet in some classrooms they have this 20% rule, but I think the bigger, bigger question is, why don't we have 100%? Why don't we have this full time where you're free to learn however, whatever, and whenever you want? Um, and like going back to Monica's point, where he, you have nothing to prove, where um, you don't necessarily, um, where learning is done for its own sake, not to impress somebody, not to get a good grade, not to get a good portfolio. It's just done because you are hooked and you are glued to something that you truly like to do. Um, and I think that's what's desperately missing from um, pretty much almost every school environment, where everything's based on coercion. And control and obedience, where do as you're told. Here's what you have to have to get done, and there's very little autonomy or very little freedom associated with that. Um, and I think also on the issue of coding, I think um, I think it's great. I think coding is a great skill to have, but I think oftentimes most people. I mean, there's there's a huge campaign um, 
I think it's through code.org, code where they tell every kid needs to learn how to code. I think that's a, I think it's a very misguided approach because what should actually be saying is that every kid should have the opportunity to code, the access to code, not necessarily forced upon a kid if they have no interest in. Uh, I mean, John Holt, he has this great quote where he says that um, children do not need to be made have to, uh, do not need to be made to learn. Uh, they need to be told how to learn. I mean, if you just give them enough access of the world, they will see them see clearly what things are really important. And then they will make themselves, then they will uh, create a path um, into that world better than anyone else could have created for them um, in the first place. Um, so giving that freedom, first and foremost, I think is so instrumental. It's, it's, a, it's a cornerstone of any kind of um, great learning philosophy. Do you think that learning philosophy works for uh, kids like Dasani? Absolutely. I think that... Um, so I w what I would say is that Dasani, she's she's been to a place, she's going to a school. Um, first of all, her life is very unstructured. She has no. Right, that's what I was gonna say. Her life seems very unstructured, and I know at least in the article they talk about how she craves the structure of school because it's a place where it is structured and somebody right. is giving her guidance. So I would what I would say is that um, because um, she's never been given an opportunity to be in an unstructured learning environment. Um, I mean, she she doesn't she doesn't know what it's like. I mean, for most kids, they they're in an unstructured learning environment from the time they're born until up until the time they get into school. Very most most very affluent kids um, are given a lot of freedom during that period of time. Um, for kids who have been in a structured environment, what I argue is that they need to go through a period period of detox. Um, they call this period of detox. Um, they do this at the Brooklyn Free School. So the kids, this is one type of democratic school where you can learn whatever you want um, and there are no required classes. Through this period of detox, what they do is that they try to go back to that natural state of learning, what everybody is born with, the gifts of curiosity, play, discovery, uh, creativity. And they start to unlearn everything and all the damaging effects that formal schooling has on children. Um, and they go back to that natural state of learning. That period of detox may take many, many months um, for kids who have been in school for a long time, um, it, it takes it takes a while. Um, Yaakov Hecht, he calls it uh, freedom shock because if you just put a kid who's been in an, a structured learning environment for many years uh, into an environment where they have full freedom, they're just gonna they're, they're gonna they're gonna drown. They're not gonna be able to survive unless they go through that period of detox where they unlearn and go back to that natural state of how human beings actually learn. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm wondering, I'm not sure Dazani's life is unstructured. In fact, I think it's too structured outside of school. Um, so I just wanted to ask about that. Like, she, you know, she has to protect herself all the time. She has to watch out for herself. You know, and she has to watch out for other people. And she can't ever be who she is. So... But I mean, in the sense yeah. that her life seems a little bit up in the air, it seems like the family is a little bit unstable, and like it doesn't seem like the beginning of the month they have a lot of money, at the end of the month they have none, and like, mm -hmm. I mean, I understand what you mean. She certainly takes on a lot of responsibility um, with her right. family, and that is certainly a structure, but it te seems to me that so, she, it seems like there's not a lot of people she can depend on. I don't know if that's the same thing as structure. Um, but, yeah, she, you know. her life is definitely controlled by several systems, and none of those systems really seem to be set up um, in her best interest, and she doesn't have a lot of agency in them, you know? I mean, she does have attachment, and I think that's the thing that she's truly lacking, um, the attachment at home. She may have attachment at school with that teacher, but at home she has very, very little attachment, and I think... Um, okay, but that's uh, not gonna that's not gonna happen though, <laughs> right? I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I I agree, but um, that, I think that's what's what's really lacking in this in her situation. So that's my question: What do we do with young people who aren't gonna have that attachment at home? You know, I mean, I, so I are you I, saying I, lack to, of attachment to her family or? Yeah. What? Do, yeah. What well, did you mean by that? I thought she was very attached to her family. No, I mean, like, a, a good uh, human being that will look after her, that is constantly, that is, that is stable, that, has, um, that is willing to um, nurture and, and tend to her. Um, I mean, it's certainly a person who is not in poverty. 
Um, I mean, I would think that uh, Gaber May, he talks a lot about attachment and how parents need to have that true and connective bond to a child for many years before they can are capable of making true friendships. Um, so I would say that a, a lot of people in poverty are lacking that, that attachment overall. So I think one of the most interesting things for me in, in the last part five of Dasani's story is that the principal invites Dasani's mother and her um, youngest, I think, was it a sister brother, the baby, into school to volunteer um, and is sort of showing that intergenerational connection that our institutions can support. Um, and, you know, she's, the principal's kind of telling the mom that, you know, the, the baby can't be loud, you know, there's some ground rules, we got to keep the baby quiet, but that embracing of the attachments that Dasani already has um, and sort of opening school up and opening, um, you know, open, tearing down sort of boundaries between home and between school um, and supporting not just the student but the families as well and that's why I think it's really interesting um, with script ed and the intergenerational approach to, to coding um, is that you know we're working with with families here in a lot of cases we're not just working with kids um, so could you talk a little bit more about that and in terms of how that works um, about, about how we work with families yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, very honestly, we, we, we haven't met a lot of our students' families. Uh, we had a few uh, parents there at our Hour of Code today. Um, I mean, I've definitely called parents a lot, you know, when the students have internships and they aren't arriving on time. I've talked to, to a lot of parents on the phone. So there's definitely an element of getting parents involved. Um, I think but, it's more about the inter intergenerational, like the, their mentors are older than the young people they're working with. Right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think a lot of that part of it is like having a role model and like having someone to say like, hey, I, you know, I did X, Y, and Z to be, be a coder and that isn't always the path of, oh, I, I, you know, majored in it in college and like, uh, you know, a lot of coders don't even have to go to college to do it. I think like having someone that's older than you and that you kind of trust to say like, hey, this is how you do it. Um, is is really great for the students and I think that the a lot of our volunteers are kind of people that are typically in their 20s and 30s um, a lot most of them don't have their own children at this point um, and I think that they our volunteers get a little attached to the kids and feel like they really have to kind of look after them our volunteers like I said earlier often stay pretty Late, way beyond the time that we ask them to stay for script ed classes, and I think it's because they really do enjoy having that impact on and the, the students' lives, and the students like being around them. So the, those volunteers come into the school. Yep. For yeah. the after, so it's an after-school program in in those schools you're working. Yeah, for all except for one of our schools. One of our schools were during the school day, but all the other schools are, and it's an after-school program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So could could we I we can can you say what you did for your hour of code? Yeah, we um so the hour of code for us was kind of not something we typically do. We did it with um I mean because we've never done an hour of code before we really do hours and hours and hours of code typically. <laughs> right. um, Which is this, what we've said on this program, right? It takes hours, but go ahead. Yeah. Um so what we did for the hour of code was we worked with the middle school that's that's uh, attached to the high school um, in, with our students. So we had our high school students mentor the middle school students through the hour of coding, but we also invited our volunteers to help the middle school students. So each middle schooler was paired with um, either a high school student or a one of our volunteers. And we did the um, code.org uh, Blockly um, hour of code tutorial, the one that's like the first one on their site with all the videos of the celebrities giving instructions on how to code. Um, and, and you know, we had lots of food and raffle prizes and stuff like that for them to kind of make it more exciting. Um, we kind of sold it as, you know, if you really like doing this when you get to high school, then, you know, you can try to sign up for Script Ed and, and do this and learn more about it. And if you want to learn on your own, you know, if they're lucky enough to have computers at home with an internet connection or if they want to do it on their own at school, 
after school we pointed them to resources where they could continue learning. And can we, so just to kind of finish out here, Kim, and I didn't realize this went so fast, but um, Kim, Mia, and Stephanie, could you say what you did for your hour of code as well? Sure, I'll, I'll just did. talk a little bit about yeah, our plans. Um, oh, it's still happening, yeah. Yeah, it's actually tomorrow we're celebrating the hour of code. Uh, of course, it's in a university setting, but really um, we're having what we call a campus code in. It's an open invitation to anyone in the university community, and I mentioned before that many children will be coming. Um, a lot of the children are... Um, children of professors or little sisters or little brothers of students, that kind of thing. But the intergenerational concept was one that I tried to emphasize in the promotion of this event. And I think because in my mind, I hoped that the children would lead the way. And it's in that notion of play and making that I had brought up earlier that I think they will instinct instinctually bring, lead the way. Um, I have two small children of my own who will be there tomorrow. Um, but they're two boys, six and eight. So my sons um, are really jazzed by these tutorials provided by the Hour of Code and have a lot of fun with them. And I can imagine um, in a room with other children and friends, they will model for us in the most beautiful way, peer learning and um, the excitement that comes from thinking in a computational way. That's what I imagine will happen, and I can write about it once something unfolds tomorrow. Cool. Thanks. In my setting, um, like I said, my students are. You, you uh, did your final as a hack gym. Yeah, I, I heard that. that. I heard that. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and okay. so we, you know, set up different stations, and one of them was sort of a remix um, holiday card station where we had all different holiday cards, cut, paste, tear up, remix, recode. So thinking about, you know, the the messages encoded in different kinds of holiday cards and the. So this, they were they were both physical and digital. Yeah. So we were okay. we were working with um, physical and digital sort of remixing and hacking. Um, using symbol X-ray goggles um, to hack uh, web pages, using um, sorry, using Mozilla X-ray goggles and um, Thimble to um, remix. Working a lot with the six-word memoirs and the postcards um, and some of the other pretty popular templates um, that are on um, Mozilla Teach the Web tools. Um, so yeah, uh, just sort of again, um, very collaborative. You know, kids working together, um, figuring things out, making things, and, and surprising themselves in the process. And Kim, did you have anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, my students um, spent their hour of code yesterday um, using Hopscotch, which is a, it's an, an iPad app, which uh, is a variation. It, it builds on Scratch. It's, it's uh, Scratch-based. Um, and they created they got to design their own winter scenes and how whatever that looked like and we had a little accidental intergenerational learning which was really fun with a we have an 84 year old grandma who comes and um, helps us out in the classroom and yesterday she got to have an eight year old um, teach her about um, how to make this iPad do the things that she wanted it to do so it was, it was really one of those beautiful settings where you have an eight-year-old girl helping this 84-year-old grandma learn how to, you know, make characters move across the screen, create um, pictures and scenes with, with the visual programming tools. Um, so that was that was our fun from yesterday, and it's it's interesting to see. We want to try to break this stereotype that it's only boys who code too, and you know, what is it that happens when? Uh, girls get their hands on it and do some different kinds of things. Well, thanks for sharing that breathlessly here at the end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Chris, did you want to add anything? With what uh, you're... Yeah, I'm the girl who's uh, organizing the thing. You know, it was her idea, uh, and so uh, we're suge I suggested let's uh, have people bring photos. Everybody's got photos, and like someone mentioned, uh, Christmas some kind of Christmas themed thing is going to happen, uh, whether it's you know a straight Christmas thing or maybe a little fun with uh, that uh, genre. 
Hi. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, this juxtaposition is provocative, but we kind of, anyway, we can continue both of these topics, is, is what I would say. Um, and, and a while ago, somebody was saying that, that we're not changing the world yet, and, and I wanted to jump in, and I'll jump, I want to jump in now and say, but for designers of the world, we've got to change things faster than we are. So, I, you know, I get it. I get that we're playing and we're figuring things out, but I'm also not satisfied with, you know, staying where we are. So just, yeah. I, I, I don't know what to do with that, but... <laughs> you know, if we can change the world, we need to. <laughs> for, we're, for trying, we're trying. We're trying. <laughs> I know. Um, so, but and but interesting, provocative thoughts tonight. Um, thank you all. I, anybody else want to add a, a question or thought as we leave? Jumping. It was great to meet you okay. all. <laughs> you as well. Likewise. Monica or Nikhil? Go ahead. Nikhil. No, no, I didn't have anything. It was uh, just, oh, great. just Thanks for the conversation. You. Okay, great. Thank you all. All right, so we meet here every Wednesday um, at Teacher Seeking Teachers. Um, thank you all for coming here tonight, um, at, uh, which is uh, published up on edtechtalk.com. And uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier founded that several years ago at worldbridges.net. Thank you all, and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.